Hi everyone, welcome to the second Precise workshop. My name is Kyle Davis, I'm a developer on the Precise team and today I just want to talk a little bit about data mapping within Precise. An overview of this talk, uh, we'll kind of discuss what is data mapping, what data mapping methods have currently been implemented in Precise, uh, we'll show some results from mapping tests that we have done and throughout the talk I'll also try to discuss some best practice tips uh, to help you for whatever application you might have, hopefully. So we can start off with a little example of what is data mapping. Maybe we have an example where we have these two surface uh, meshes. On the right could be a fluid solver, on the left the mesh from a solid solver, for example. And for these meshes we have these vertices where we have uh, data values at these vertices. So for the mesh on the right, where these edges meet up, uh, there might be a vertex at each of these points. So a vertex is, de is defined here as one of these gray spheres. That's the location of a vertex point. And at each of these vertices, we have some data. So we have some knowledge about the values on the surface. And likewise, we have the vertices on the mesh on the left. So all of these blue spheres, these are the vertices for the solid solver in an example test case and these meshes actually overlap with each other so what we want to do is we want to map the data that is currently sitting on the gray spheres to the blue spheres and that is essentially what data mapping is in this case so the current data mapping methods that are available in precise are the nearest neighbor nearest projection and radial basis function mapping they all have their own pros and cons. For the nearest neighbor mapping, it is computationally cheap and it is easy to perform. However, it is the least accurate method. Nearest projection is a bit more accurate in this case. However, it does require extra information from your solver, such as the edge connectivity between vertices. And it's a little bit more computationally expensive than nearest neighbor, but far less than radial basis function mapping. However, radial base function mapping does have the ability to be more accurate for some test cases. So a little overview how they work. Imagine we have some geometry which is defined by this gray line and we have an input mesh which is the are these blue dots that you can see in this kind of orange dot over here is our output mesh and we have data values at all of these blue vertices and we need to determine the value on the output vertice or vertex and in this case, for nearest neighbor mapping, it simply assumes the value of the vertex closest to it. We can also then bound the error of this method to be first order accurate as the error is directly dependent on this edge length h. So that edge length is the distance between vertices throughout this mesh. Uh, if we extend this a little more for nearest projection mapping, what we need to do is we need to provide, provide the edge connectivity between all of these vertices here and the first step is to project this output vertex onto the nearest surface so we have this projection step and once we have the location of the vertex onto the nearest surface we can do a bilinear interpolation to the vertices on the input mesh. What we can see is that the error for the nearest projection method uh, is Form, is formed by two parts. One is this projection error which is determined from this initial projection step and that's first order accurate and the second is the interpolation error which is due to this bilinear interpolation step and is second order accurate with regard to the edge length throughout the mesh. For, near, for radial basis function mapping we can start off with the example on the right um, and simply what it is is the value on the output mesh is a function of all of the vertices on the input mesh. Now this can be quite expensive uh, if you have a very large input mesh. So what we can do is we can apply local RBFs in this case where we only consider the vertices that lie within the radius R of uh, the output mesh vertex in this case. So here we can see a sphere around or a circle around the output vertex and it only considers vertices on the input mesh that lie within the sphere. Another thing a lot of you that have performed data mapping within Precise have noticed is this consistent versus conservative mapping. So it's a little example of what that is. Uh, 
for uh, a nearest neighbor mapping as a little example in this case. Consistent mapping would be for quantities that are normalized, so for example displacement, whereas for conservative mapping you want to conserve the total summation of values across the interface. So um, it, let's say we have the forces for the conservative mapping, we want the total force on the structure or the surface to remain the same after mapping as well. So for the output mesh here in blue, it will simply be the summation of the nearest points on the input mesh. So every vertex on the input mesh is connected to a vertex on the output mesh. However, for a consistent mapping, which might be something like displacement, we can see that the output mesh value only takes the value of a single vertex on the input mesh and not a summation of a few points. For something like displacement, this is quite a uh, intuitive uh, thing to understand where of course the displacement at this point is not the summation of displacements of a few points on the input mesh. However this is a very simplistic example for nearest neighbor mapping however the the total the, the concept is kind of consistent with any any mapping that you perform. So a little bit more theory uh, regarding the radial basis function mapping is they can be quite difficult to work with in, in these cases. What we would like to do is to fit a interpolation field through all of the points where we have information. So for example, we want to uh, generate this interpolant field S such that if we evaluate this field at the input mesh vertex locations, we will get the data that we have at that vertex point. And this interpolation field is made up of these basis functions here. You can see this base function phi as a function of the distance between two vertices and some shape parameter function. We also include a polynomial terms here in order to increase the accuracy of the interpolation. And what we need to do is solve for these coefficients gamma here in the front. In order to guarantee a unique solution, we also need to provide additional constraints for these polynomial uh, terms and that is provided here at the bottom. So in the end what this does is this creates a matrix of all basis functions and we can then solve for this linear system. So here we have um, all of the basis functions that we put into this matrix M which consists of uh, evaluating these basis functions between every single point on the input mesh. So every point in the input mesh it has a basis function applied between itself and every other point on the input mesh for a, a global RBF function. We also have these polynomial terms uh, where the amount of rows is equivalent to the number of points in your input mesh and the number of columns is equal to the number of dimensions that you're working with plus one. And we have here the coefficients we are trying to solve for all the basis functions as well as the polynomial coefficients. And essentially we have just have a linear system which we can combine the matrix for the basis functions M and we can uh, add P and P transpose to this for the polynomials. We can concatenate all the coefficients we are trying to solve for and all of the known values that we, we have on the interface. Now what you, a problem we might uh, normally encounter when using local RBFs is that the sparsity of the matrix that we can form is ruined. So if we, for example, have a dense RBF case or a, a global RBF, we have a dense matrix M and we have these dense matrices P and P transpose. But if we use local RBFs, this matrix M is quite sparse. So here we might find that your uh, combined matrix A has a lot of zeros in them and uh, any chance to kind of uh, work with the, the sparse matrices are lost as we have these very dense rows and columns at the edges of our matrix A. So what we might want to do is remove those uh, columns and rows and that's exactly what we do with the separated polynomials. So what you can do in Precise um, is you can just use this polynomial separate tag in your uh, config file and then it will perform the separate polynomial mapping and what it does is it removes the matrix P and P transpose from A and we solve for this with the least squares fit to solve for the coefficients beta 
in this uh, formula and then we subtract that uh, polynomial from the input vector f and then we solve for the coefficients gamma um, to solve f minus p times beta instead then what we do at the end once we have solved for a gamma we then use that in order to evaluate our interpolation function on the output mesh and then we add these polynomial terms onto the result we get from that. So essentially the polynomial terms uh, fits a least squares function through the field and the RBF solves for the remainder of that solution. This is very uh, handy when you want to uh, solve for uh, very large problems where you have thousands or millions of points in your input mesh and you need to use local RBFs. This can greatly enhance your accuracy of interpolation. We also perform rescaling, uh, which is always done during the initialization step. And this further uh, provides improvement. Um, what we do is we take the regular RBF, which is this SF, um, which was just described above, and we divide that by applying a test function of one across all values on the input mesh and solving for those coefficients and solving for the interpolant and then we have this rescaled interpolant here and that can provide uh, better accuracy where the magnitudes of the values on the mesh can vary significantly so this is automatically performed during this initialization in precise you might have noticed uh, sometimes if it does not solve then it says rescaling did not converge rescaling is being turned off and it still continues to run and that just means that this rescaling is then no longer performed inside of precise so how we solve for these system of equations in precise one of the methods is to use an iterative solver petsy so this uses a gm race solver and we just solve for the vector x with the given interpolation matrix a and the vertex data b so we have this ax is equal to b and we want to solve for x and we have this kind of relative residual r which is equal to b minus ax and we iterate over this input vector x uh, to try and minimize this residual r however uh, in this case for if we have very very large meshes this can be very difficult to drive the r value down so in precise currently this relative residual uh, convergence threshold is set to 10 to the minus 9 and if there is troubles with trying to achieve such low accuracy then uh, precise will actually give an error and it will stop running so you can remove this by actually increasing the solver rtol value in your config file so here uh, you simply add solver rtol you can make it 1 uh, e to the minus 3 or to the minus 5 and then this would uh, increase the threshold for uh, reaching convergence. However, you'll get slightly less accurate data interpolation, but uh, you will have convergence of your uh, PETSI solver. Another way to perform the mapping is to use a direct solver, which we use Eigen for. Uh, and this does a QR composition, decomposition on the matrix A. And we end up with the the solution being this rx equals to minus qtb um, and we can simply solve for x with a single backward substitution of r as r is now an upper triangular matrix instead however this is only implemented in serial in precise so you can use it when running in parallel however all the vertices are sent to the master rank and the qrd composition is done within the master rank only so the mapping step is always done in serial even if your problem is running in parallel however if you don't have petsy or if you would like to use eigen you can just add the term use qr decomposition equal to one into your solver config and this will turn on the eigen solver instead so some mapping tests that we have done we have two test cases one is a kind of synthetic geometry which is a very simple test case the unit cube and the second one is a wind turbine blade that's a bit more tricky to perform data mapping because you might have these two sides of the wind turbine blade sitting quite close to each other um, then also all the points being at the tip of the wind turbine blade could also sometimes cause some issues but in this case we will uh, test these geometries 
So we apply a test function, uh, cosine test functions to both of these cases. We use a, a relatively low frequency test function for this unit cube here. It is in any way quite a simple problem. And we apply uh, a cosine function at a higher frequency on the wind turbine blade. So we can see these os oscillations happening down the length of the turbine blade. Then to perform the mapping test in order to show how accurate these solutions can be, what we did was is we mapped from an input mesh A to uh, an output mesh B, but we always keep the output mesh B fixed. Then we change the size of the mesh of the input mesh A. So we start off with a very coarse mesh and we gradually refine the input mesh A while keeping the output mesh B constant. Then we apply this test function to both input and output mesh A and B. So we end up with these terms VI A real and VI B real, uh, which is just equal to this function evaluated on all vertices on both meshes. And then we perform the data mapping from mesh A to mesh B. And that results in VI B interpolant, which is the interpolated values on the output mesh B. And then we can get a per vertex error uh, which is simply the interpolate values minus the real values that we have. And we can compute the relative L2 error um, by summing them or by summing the squares together and dividing by the total number of vertices on the output mesh. So some results we have for the unit cube. Looking at this graph on the Y axis, we have the relative L2 error on mesh B on our output mesh. And on the input mesh, we have here the edge length of input mesh A. And what this edge length is, it is the edge length between two different vertices on the input mesh. So the smaller the edge length value, the finer the mesh we have. So the more vertices we have in the input mesh. So the first thing we can notice from this uh, unit cube test case is that the nearest neighbor mapping is first order accurate that was expected. And we can also see that this red line, this nearest projection mapping is second order accurate. And in this case, it was expected because there should be no projection error as we are just dealing with flat surfaces. But as we'll see, that's not the case for the wind turbine blade. For the thin plate splines problem, we can see that we very quickly run out of memory because this has a global RBF test function or, or global RBF function, I should say, and we run out of memory as we have to form these very dense matrices. Uh, if you can remember the matrix M, that is a very dense matrix. Every point in this uh, matrix is filled and uh, we very quickly run, run out of memory. Then we also tested the Gaussian test functions uh, for both the integrated and separate polynomials. And we can see that the separate polynomial greatly outperforms the integrated polynomial, as in this case, we are dealing with a local RBF instead of a global RBF. However, for this simple test case, the nearest projection still outperforms the uh, separated uh, polynomial for the Gaussian. Moving on to a more complicated test case for the wind turbine blade. Now we get rid of the thin plate splines However, we have two different Gaussians that we use. We use Gaussian N3 and N5. And what this means is this Gaussian uses a shape parameter based on a support radius of three times the edge length provided. And for the Gaussian N5, it uses a support radius of five times the edge length provided. So the Gaussian N5 should have a larger support radius and theoretically a, a, a lower um, error. So we can see once again that the nearest neighbor is first order accurate. Um, in this case, we are also mapping onto the mesh B with an edge length of 0 0.025. So that's it's roughly over here. I should go, sorry. So roughly at this point over here. And we can see before this point, the nearest projection mapping is not quite first order, but it's not quite second order either. However, once the input mesh becomes a lot more fine, finer than the output mesh, the error can reduce quite drastically and it can start to approach second order accurate or accuracy. Um, we also see that the Gaussian N5 
is more accurate than the Gaussian M3. That's expected as we have a larger support radius around the vertices and also that the separate Gaussians perform much better than the integrated polynomial Gaussians and we can see that even the Gaussian with support radius of 3 and the separate polynomial outperforms the Gaussian in 5 with an integrated polynomial. Then we perform these mappings again, however we map onto the output mesh with an edge length of 0.001 instead and we see that in this case uh, the nearest projection mapping is first order accurate only however we can get better accuracy with the Gaussian with the separated polynomials with both N3 and N5 Gaussians with the N5 Gaussians being almost an order of magnitude better than nearest projection mapping in this case almost so this has hopefully been a little bit of a a nice introduction to the data mapping and kind of explaining what happens inside of Precise for this RBF mapping. Um, some future work that we want to do to try and improve this is to provide a support radius for Gaussians. So at the moment the Gaussian RBFs only uh, take a shape parameter function and not an actual support radius and the shape parameter needs to be calculated beforehand. We want to try and introduce uh, that the Gaussians just take a support radius as an input as well. We also want to change up how we interact with PETC a little bit so that when PETC doesn't reach the required convergence tolerance that Precise doesn't give an error and stop running. However, that it returns a warning with more mean meaningful information uh, to actually provide you with the information you need in order to see is this mapping good enough for my test case? Do I need to change something? However, your, your problem won't just crash and you don't know why. We also plan to make the Artificial Solver Testing Environment, or ASTA, more user-friendly. And in this case, you can um, just input your geometries as VTK files and you can perform different mapping tests and actually determine the mapping error from the inputs that you have set in your config file. And then we also want to add some error estimation techniques for RBF mappings inside of, uh, of Precise. So this would take the actual data that you get from your solvers during runtime and estimate the mapping error that you have. There are some techniques to do this, however, they're not so easy to implement uh, inside of the kind of large distributed um, solver and how to get them to run together in parallel is not so, so simple. So this is some future work that we have going at the moment. This is some reference that we have and thank you very much for your time.